It is time for the NFL Every Game on the Board podcast. Robbie Vino starting us off, and we'll have Andrew McGinnis, a, a new handicapper with Sports Memo, finish it in conclusion here. But without further ado, Rob Vino, welcome to the podcast. How are you, buddy? I am doing great, Drew. Absolutely great. Um, you know, Braves winner last night kicked us over that 40-unit mark since July the 1st, all sports. So once again, real happy with the results and looking forward to this weekend. Yeah, Robbie. I mean, we do have the uh, NFL Every Game on the Board podcast, but that wouldn't you're up 40 units since what the beginning of July. Absolutely crazy, man. Keep it up. And uh, you know, in NFL and college football, you're what 24 and 16, 60 percent on the year, up over 11 units, guys. He's got a 20 star up and available at SportsMemo.com right now for college football. Also has some NFL action up, um, and you can get his NFL and college football full season for under a grand and also we have a special uh, extra hundred dollars off of the all already discounted price by using podcast when you're checking out that's all lower ca- all lowercase podcast when you're checking out for an extra hundred dollars off your order robbie let's start it off from the top four six one four six two indy at philly 47 the total looks like the eagles laying seven at home against the colts what's your opinion on this one yeah, boy, lots to sort through in this game, right, Drew? I mean, the biggest headline is the fact that Carson Wentz is going to return the quarterback to Philadelphia Eagles, whether that is an immediate help or whether that's going to take some time for Wentz to work off the rust. Uh, that remains to be seen. We'll know better once the game gets underway, and then um, we'll know even better once the game is over. But Carson Wentz certainly the biggest, the biggest headline in that game. I think here in Philadelphia – the biggest concern is the fact that Frank Reich returns home to Philadelphia. He now the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts, but fan base, media, uh, all alike the last three days, especially a little bit worried that perhaps he knows exactly what Philadelphia will do. Remember, as the offensive coordinator last year, he does know the playbook. Doug Peterson has said there'll there'll be some adjustments made here uh, to signal calls and whatnot to keep uh, Indy on there a little off balance, whether that works or not. Again, you know, there's a lot of ifs and questions inside this game. Uh, The Philadelphia defensive line, which is the strength of this football team, that rotation deeper than any inside the National Football League, um, their overall performance, I would argue, the best defensive line in the National Football League but they play their first mobile quarterback this week. I, the first two weeks of the season going up against Matt Ryan and Ryan Fitzpatrick, those are not exactly guys who get outside the pocket and make a ton of plays. Andrew Luck makes a lot of plays outside the pocket, so it'll be a little test for the defensive line as well. Philly's pass defense allowing 309 yards per game. That's a huge number. A lot of it obviously due to that disaster last week against Tampa. Um, But still, the defensive secondary, without a ton of help from the defensive line, if they can't get to luck, could be in some trouble here. Is seven might be too strong, Drew. I think this initial push was made simply because Wentz is in at quarterback instead of Foles. I agree he's the better, you know, quarterback, obviously. He's one of the best in the NFL. Still coming back after so long on the sidelines. We'll see how he performs. I would think that Indy off of their win last week uh, at Washington showed that they're going to be able to go to venues and not be real intimidated here with Andrew Luck at quarterback. Robbie, we got uh, a good one here. Cincinnati at Carolina, 43 and a half the total. Looks like the Panthers laying three at home. Interested in your opinion on this one, Robbie. Yeah, this Carolina answered some questions last week, Drew. Uh, across that offensive line, they were so banged up. When we talked on the podcast last week, we talked about the position switches they were going to have to make, how injuries affected the scrambling of putting together a five-man offensive line in Carolina. The wild card, of course, in any of that is always Cam Newton will make do with whatever they throw in front of him, um, however decimated that offensive line may be. And last week... They pretty much answered the bell. 24 points against the Atlanta Falcons, which is a very good defense. Cam Newton didn't see the ground too often in that game. So I would think against this Cincinnati team, your your first concern is going to be Geno Atkins in that defensive front against the Carolina offensive line. But I think that concern got answered last week. I don't know that since he's going to be able to 
just bully Carolina up front here, especially with Cam at quarterback. And they really have it down to a science here, the quick passing game, now that they have Christian McCaffrey in the backfield. He went wild last week with 14 catches, something for Cincinnati certainly to contend with. On the other side of the ball, uh, Carolina's defense has to find a way to stop Cincinnati, which has been a real good offense so far, 70 points, or excuse me, um, 34 points last week against the Baltimore defense. That's every bit as good, if not better, than Carolina. So I think that when you look at this game, I was a little surprised that the total went down from 44 to 43. I see two offenses that should be able to do some damage here. The Carolina Panthers thus far um, through two games had a rough go first week against Dallas, but certainly, like I say, did a good job offensively making some corrections in the second week. I think 43 might be too low of a number there in that total. Robbie, you bring up Geno Atkins. He's he's a heck of a player, huh? He's a heck of a player. And it's not just him. It goes beyond him on that defensive front. Um, they're one of the better defensive lines inside uh, the league as far as getting to the quarterback, being disruptive in the backfield and whatnot. Uh, but I guess say, in that Atlanta game, I thought that the Carolina uh, offensive line stuff might be do a little bit of damage to their offensive output even though I played the game over I thought Cam might be able, be able to overcome some of it it did go over he did overcome more than some of it they overcame a lot of it so I don't see that as being a real bad matchup here for Carolina their OL against since he's DL yeah he, he can get down and, and be kind of mean there on the defensive line and uh I, I you just bring up the name it reminds me of uh high school football he, he put me on my back a couple times playing against him in high school so uh yeah he's a heck of a player sorry but. about that drew <laughs> <laughs> no Flash no worries man. <laughs> it's good stuff it's it's fun to watch him playing in the nfl we got four six five four six six tennessee jacksonville Looks like we got a number out now at a couple shops. Uh, I'm seeing nine as far as the Jags laying at home, 39 the total. Is that the number you're seeing, Robbie, and and any opinion on the game? Yeah, that's exactly what we're seeing right now is nine and 39. We'll see if um, it becomes a universal number. There's an added number up there, Drew, five dimes at 10.5 plus 15 cents. So that certainly is, you know, if you like the underdog side, you're going to go ahead and grab the over two scores plus the half rather than just taking nine um pretty good discrepancy there between chris and five dimes marcus Mariota's likely to play here i think is what we get out of what we've seen monday through friday he's returned to practice however there are some reports out there drew and there's a report out there with footage of yesterday's practice of Mariota throwing the football where he doesn't necessarily look like he's the Marcus Mariota you'll need against the Jacksonville defense. Now, remember, he's, he injured his UCL in week one, and what it caused was numbness in the fingers in his throwing hand. doesn't seem to have as good of a feel for the football right now. That can obviously affect the way he throws it. Uh, even if he plays, I'd venture to say that Although Tennessee is saying, you know, oh, he's coming along, he's getting better, he's getting better, it doesn't look like he's getting better fast enough, especially against, like I say, the Jacksonville Jaguars defense. It's a divisional game. You know Jacksonville's going to come to play, even though they played New England last week, a game that they certainly had 100% focus for. I don't see any problem with the Jaguars getting back up and focusing that intensely once again for a divisional rival in Tennessee, especially a divisional team that's already 1-0 and this season inside the division. That was a huge win last week for Tennessee over the Houston Texans. Expect a big effort out of Jacksonville. Uh, Leonard Fournette has returned to starting running back for the Jags. There's a lot of matchups in this game, Drew, that seem to favor um, the Jacksonville side those two in particular I don't see Tennessee if Mariota is not right and even if he's only 70% right he's just not a good enough passer to dent the Jacksonville defense so I'd probably be more interested in laying the low number that we see here nine at Chris Uh, certainly you don't want to lay ten and a half when you can lay nine but I would look that direction with Jacksonville here I think they're in it's a pretty good matchup in favor of them yeah, this number's starting to come out. Chris has got it posted. 
Um, so yeah, make sure to check that out and get the best number using Sports Memo Odds page. Uh, Robbie, we uh, moved down the card here. We got New Orleans, Atlanta, good one here in the NFC South. 53 and a half the total. Looks like the Falcons laying three at home in Mercedes-Benz Stadium. What's your feel on this one? You know, you don't like to get too carried away and say that the season hinges on this game in week three uh, of the 2018 campaign. But for New Orleans, it probably does. The New Orleans Saints off to a dreadful start. 0-2, already 0-1 inside the division, and now they play another divisional game here against the Atlanta Falcons. So New Orleans has to be treated as a team that's backed into a corner, and I would expect their best effort of the season, whatever that is. And New Orleans may just not be that good, Drew, and best effort might not matter. Uh, But from a situational standpoint, You have to look at New Orleans, ignore the first two results from a situational standpoint, not fundamental, but situational standpoint, ignore the first two results and just know that they're going to come to Atlanta and they're going to be uh, fully focused and ready to go in desperate, desperate need of a victory here against the Falcons. The other side of that coin, of course, the Falcons inside the same division already 1-0 and they can put some distance between themselves and the Saints. You know Atlanta fears Drew Brees down the road, 13 games left in the season, and they'd love nothing more than to put a little bit of distance early on this season. A two-game lead would be huge for them. It looks like Julio Jones is going to play here. You know, I think we can almost 95% count on that week by week. Julio Jones, a guy that doesn't practice much because of lingering injuries, but game day, he's always there. Um, and, and the way that that New Orleans secondary has performed so far, who wouldn't want to be there, right? New Orleans giving up 325 and a half yards per game through the air. That should really make Matt Ryan and company, um, you know, excited to see the field. They played a much better game offensively last week against Carolina. You know, there are a lot of questions and a lot of dart throwing at Steve Sarkeesian after that Philadelphia Eagles game. Um you know, and, and then all of a sudden next week, all you have to do is wait one week and they put up 31 on Carolina. So I think people need to ease up on who they're ripping um, and, and give it a little opportunity here. The Atlanta offense just seems to have difficulty. If you ask me, you could narrow it down to red zone versus the Eagles, period. That seems to be the time they have trouble. Red zone versus the Eagles. Otherwise, not too bad. Um, kind of a low price here, Drew. But again, I'm afraid to play the favorite just because I know New Orleans – can get involved in a shootout and it could end up 34 31 obviously the increase in total indicates that the money likes this game going up and over not much resistance from a new orleans defense which (laughs) you know after last year everybody um could see with their own two eyes that this defense had made big big strides in improving that side of the football you look for more of that this year and through two games we've seen none of it so again this will be a real test, a real telltale story for the New Orleans Saints in this game. It makes it difficult to bet, but I do think maybe 53 and a half, you could look a little bit over there. Um, you start getting involved with 54 and 55 and 56, though. They're all key numbers. So the next bump of a half a point in that total, I would say value starts to decrease uh, pretty rapidly. So if you want to get it, I would get it right now before it hits a little higher. So come Sunday morning when everybody's in line with their $25 bets and their $50 bets, that thing's liable to push up even higher. Good stuff, Robbie. And guys, uh, make sure to check out Robbie's packages on sportsmemo.com, hitting 60% on the year in college and NFL. And we got that special coupon, podcast, all lowercase when you're checking out for an extra $100 off. Um, we got 469, 470, Denver Broncos, Baltimore Ravens. Looks like the Ravens laying five at home, Robbie, 44 and a half the total. Yeah, it's a real test for Denver, Drew, because if you go through their schedule, the first two games, they're untested. There's no question Denver's untested. They played a depleted Seattle Seahawks defense game one. Then they played the Oakland Raiders defense, not a very good one, and also on a short work week. In week two, they come from behind and win that game. Philip Lindsay has emerged as a rookie running back. Uh, I don't want to call him starter, but probably between him and Royce Freeman, two rookies, 1A and 1B. And they've led the Broncos to 157 rushing yards per game, which um, is the second highest in the NFL right now. So the run game has been good. But again, 
I really look at the competition level here for the Broncos. Not that good. Certainly nothing in the um, vicinity of what the Baltimore Ravens are going to bring. And you also have to take into consideration that Denver's played their first two games at home. This is going to be the first road trip of the season for the Broncos. Baltimore's awful loss to Cincinnati last Thursday, so they've had extra time to prepare here. The Denver secondary, which has been um, pretty good this season, going to be tested here by Joe Flacco and that new core of wide receivers. The Denver ground uh, defense has been real, real good, so it might be hard for Baltimore to run the football. But I do think Flacco and company might be able to throw it a little bit here. I agree with the line move, Drew. I just think that um, Denver right now with Case Keenum at quarterback is an improved team. But I don't know if they're improved enough at this point in time to go on the road in this particular situation. Baltimore at home with rest and Denver untested. I don't know if Denver is good enough to go there and cover the the five point number. So I'd look towards the Ravens in that game. All right, Robbie, we got one game left here on the one o'clock slate for Sunday. Four seven one four seven two. New York Football Giants at Houston. Looks like Houston laying six at home. Forty two the total. And you know the, a majority of the country right now, Drew, ready to just run Eli Manning right to the cemetery and bury him and get somebody else in there. Um, It's obviously he takes the brunt of the blame every time the Giants don't succeed. And I don't know if it's fair because their offensive line is one of the worst in football. Let's face it. uh, He is a sitting duck back there, which makes it even more difficult for him to perform when that offensive line just leaks like a sieve. But you have a battle right now in this game of two of the worst offensive lines inside the NFL. The Giants are terrible. Houston's terrible, too. They can't protect Deshaun Watson right now. Um, And it's funny because when you look at the matchup, the first thing, at least the first thing that came to my mind was J.J. Watt, Jadavian Clowney returning, Whitney Merciless, these guys lining up against the Giant front. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, Eli Manning is going to get killed this week. But it does work. The other way as well, the difference being that Deshaun Watson can get out of the way of some trouble where Eli Manning can't. So two really good defensive fronts, Houston getting the edge there. I think they're better against two miserable offensive lines. But again, Houston getting the edge because their quarterback has mobility. So the Texans right now with a little bit of an edge in the what's terrible department where each are concerned. I think, you know, the Giants cannot run the football right now. If you take Saquon Barkley's 68-yard run in week one out of the equation, I think I read this morning that he's only averaging two yards per carry outside of that. So not only can't this offensive line pass protect, they can't open up holes for the running game. At least Houston is running the football. I talked before about Denver being second in the NFL, 157 yards per game. That's because Houston's number one in the NFL by a half a yard, 157 and a half for the Houston Texans. So, I mean, even when you take the worst qualities of these teams and their lower echelon in a lot of places, Houston comes out on top of the Giants pretty favorably in a lot of these instances. So I can understand six to six and a half. What would scare you somewhat is the Houston secondary against Odell Beckham Jr., Um, and Sterling Shepard, those guys' ability to make a play or two that could keep this thing close. And Houston's offense just hasn't begun to give you any reason why you would want to lay six and a half points. And they scored 20 against New England, didn't look good doing it. Scored 17 against Tennessee last week, didn't look good doing it. It's a little difficult. Uh, You have a little difficulty, Drew, walking up to the counter and saying, give me Houston minus six and a half when the offense is sputtering as bad as it is. What about the under at 42? That's a possibility here. Very possible. Um, You would hope what you would hope for in an under 42 is that neither one of these quarterbacks gives anything away. You don't want Eli Manning to throw that pick six. You don't want Eli Manning to get strip sacked on his own 20 yard line, you know, and, and get easy points. Um, If you can avoid the easy points and the quarterbacks play clean, 42 looks like a mountain for these two to climb. All right. I I, I like it as well, Robbie. And and great stuff. Make sure to check out Robbie's work on sportsmemo.com. Follow him on Twitter at RobVinoSports. Rob, thanks for the time. We'll we'll talk with you next week, and we'll be right back with Andrew McGinnis to finish out the uh, NFL Every Game on the Board.